So Grace, let me start by saying how honored I am to interview, today, interview you today. Um, you've been the primary clinical influence in my career and an amazing colleague, mentor, and friend. So thank you very much for everything you've done for me and so many others in GI and in gastrointestinal endoscopy. I'm honored to have you say that. Thank you. So Grace, tell us how you got started in advanced endoscopy. Right, so it was a, it was a different era. Um, it, I was a resident uh, in the 70s uh, at uh, Tufts New England Medical Center, and uh, um, Richard Norton, who never published, so most of you don't know his name probably, um, but he um, went to Japan and learned from the person who actually did the first ERCPs. Mm -hmm. And he came back and he was the first person in New England to do ERCP. It was mostly diagnostic then. We had, CAT scan was rudimentary mm -hmm. uh, and there was no MRI. Uh, and so we did a lot of diagnostic studies, but we were a referral center during my residency. And then I stayed there for my fellowship. Um, Doug Howell was the second person in New England to start doing ERCP. He went to uh, England and learned with Peter Cotton. Mm -hmm. And so the two of them were really the pioneers in all of New England. But it just happened to be that's the institution I was at and sure. that was the institution I was doing my training at. So I learned ERCP and sphincterotomy and stone extraction. Uh, when I went to Michigan after my two-year fellowship, um, in 1982, I started in, at University of Michigan on the faculty. Uh, I was asked, do you know how to do ERCP and, and sphincterotomy? Because they had someone doing sure. ERCP but not sphincterotomy and stone extraction. I said yes, and that started my path. So it was different because people didn't subspecialize in those days. We all did everything. Uh, but once you sort of started down a path, I just kept on that path. I gotcha. And so tell me along those lines how you got started in the ASGE. Right, so the ASGE um, came a little bit later in my career. I actually, my uh, division chief was Tasha Yamada for many years, uh -huh. and he um, put me on, or got me on committees uh, for the AGA, and so I was on a couple of AGA committees, and I actually was the first woman to sit on the AGA governing board, even though I was a non-voting position, and that was in the mid-90s, because I was chair of their, what they called patient, I think it was patient care committee, but it was basically their guideline committee. So I was chair of the uh, AJ committee. Um, and then on that committee was Mike Kimmy, mm -hmm. and um, Mike said, Grace, what are you doing in the AGA? You belong in the ASG. So Mike you know, was already moving up in the ASG at that time and sort of got me very involved in the ASG and then I just stayed on. And that's how it sort of progressed. And that's how it progressed, right. And so as you know, this is going to be the first time that all uh, four societies are, uh, the presence of all four societies are right. going to be women. Yeah. And so of course, you know, you have a very central role in that because you've been a, ro a role model for so many. Yeah, no, it, it's great. I just came from the uh, AGA Women's Luncheon and they had all four of the women on stage and they all talked about sort of their history and how they got there, yeah. and, and it, was, it was really very moving. Yeah, it, it, it was really exciting. Is, it really is a good time, and you know, I think uh, we've sort of needed more uh, women in at least advanced endoscopy, and it's nice to see the tides uh, changing, and right. I think you've been very influential on in that. Yeah. So I want to touch on leadership a little bit, because you, um, you know, have been the clinical chief at uh, one of the largest and one of the best divisions of gastroenterology uh, in the country and you've just done that so well. Um, and so from your perspective, for the next up and coming Grace Elta, what is your advice in terms of leadership, um, uh, especially sort of looking at it from an endoscopist perspective? Right. So, you know, I think you have to walk the walk. Uh, I think you, you can't expect other people to do things that you don't mm -hmm. do. Uh, and so that's very important. I think you have to be uh, fair. So, and be perceived as fair so that, you know, because there's always competing interests and competing needs sure. and, and so that those two things, walk the walk and, and be totally fair and, you know, to be humble too, you know, to, to recognize that uh, you're surrounded by a lot of very talented people and you want to have them have the leeway to, to explore those talents. Right. Well, along those lines, I, re I remember when I was a fellow uh, at the University of Michigan with you. I was about to start on faculty and we saw a patient with pancreas divism and recurrent pancreatitis and we offered the patient an ERCP and she accepted. And I said to you, okay, Grace, when do you want to do this case? And you said to me, are you crazy? You know, you're about to start on faculty. Why don't you put that patient on your schedule? 
And I think you've been such a facilitator all along, both clinically and personally and professionally. For okay. sure. And, Thank you, Joe. And al along those lines, Grace, I mean, I think one of the th many things I admire so much about you is that you always do the right thing and you're always sort of just about how you make decisions regardless of the consequences. Is that something that just you were sort of born with? It? Is it an innate quality or is mm -hmm. it something that you pick up with time and experience and wisdom and things? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question because I don't really think of myself in that way. I, I do, one of the things I often do ask myself is how would I want to be treated? Or if, if, you know, if this was my, my father or my daughter, sure. uh, how would I, what would I want them to have? And so if you put yourself in other people's shoes and say, or if it's another colleague, how would I feel in this situation? Uh, then you know, it, it sort of brings it to home and, and it gives you a little more understanding of how other things are. I got you. So there's you know, a lot of really talented, um, thoughtful, and skilled people in advanced endoscopy. And so I think we all have our list of you know, who are the people we look up to and who are the people we admire. So you're obviously on my list, but tell us more about who are some of the people in endoscopy that you sort of look up to and, right. and admire. Well, certainly in my early career days, uh, some of the real thought leaders were people like Glenn Lehman, Joe Geenan. In fact, I went uh, in the mid-80s, I went to a Joe Geenan course to learn sphincter <laughs> That was a good use of your time. Yeah, good use of my time. <laughs> so th they were clearly uh, leaders, uh, Peter Cotton. Uh, you know, I, I always used to tell every fellow, when you're going to read an endoscopy book, just read Peter's book because uh, it's short, it's sweet, it's to the point, and accurate. So, Absolutely. you know, the, the, many of those people I knew really from a distance more than up close, okay. but I still admired them. So, um, being an academic advanced endoscopist is very hard, right? Because in order to be sort of relevant and contributory, you also have to do a lot of cases, yeah. right? So, it's not like we have the luxury of tons of protected time, even if we wanted it. We have to be present, right? So you have your clinical schedule, which is always sort of you know, difficult, and you are sort of trying to balance that with um, the research element of it and you know, your contribution to societies and, of course, the work-life balance, right? Um, so there is going to be a high burnout rate, and doing yeah. this is hard. So what's your advice to people in terms of being able to quote unquote have it all and to have a fulfilling career and to sort of limit the likelihood of running into apathy and burnout? Right, I think there is a lot of burnout. I think it's increasing. Um, I think electronic medical records increased it, decreasing reimbursement for everything we do, putting us all on a faster pace uh, has increased burnout. Uh, um, in terms of what's my advice, my advice is, um, think about where you are in, in your life at that time. So um, in the 80s when I had young children, I really limited my hours. Um, now I work like a crazy person. <laughs> <laughs> but then again, I don't have any young children at home either, so it's very different. So I think that your career can change over the years depending on your own situation. Um, but I think you have to keep yourself sane, whether it's you know, exercise, giving yourself time to exercise, giving yourself time to do the things you like to do, whatever they may be. So you gotta keep yourself sane, but also I think the demands on you will change over time. That's, they certainly have for me. Sure. Are you still really big into jazzercise? I am, yeah. <laughs> so, it's a, I, one of my memories from the University of Michigan is you skipping out of advanced endo conference about two minutes early so you could make the jazzercise yes, class. Absolutely, so, yeah. So. yeah. You have to make time for yourself. I, I believe in that. I think that will help burn out because I think we're at all at risk for that. And I think it's it's a stressful job caring for sick patients and and you know the mistakes you make and or the complications you have. That's one of the things advanced mm -hmm. endoscopy mm -hmm. uh, you know plagues you with the complications you think about them at night. So you have to make some time for yourself. Yeah, and you and I have had many heart-to-heart -heart conversations about that and about um, sort of managing complications and yes. the psychological impact of that. And so I think you've been very sort of helpful to me in, in what is probably the most difficult part of our job. Right. I agree. So, um, so um, you know, the healthcare landscape is changing. It's been changing for a while, but it seems like it's changing even more dramatically. You have such a great and now long perspective, and you've sort of been at every level. 
Is there anything that you see um, or any advice you could give to somebody like me coming up in their career, how that might influence our decision? Yeah, I, I think fee-for-service is going away, um, although it'll probably be slower than we think because nothing moves fast. Um, but it will go away. I think um, for the main thing that physicians need to do is still focus on what's best for their patients. Uh, and you know, do what you do the best, do the research, the clinical, keep updated in, in all the clinical arenas uh, so you can be the best you can for your patients. And you know, I trust that we'll, we'll still be here, still taking yeah. care of patients, yeah. even though I think our reimbursement structure will totally change. I got you. I have to confess, I'm not updated in my hep C management uh, algorithms, <laughs> uh, but I know what you're saying. So uh, uh, an amazing, a long, illustrious career what sort of stands out the most? What are you most proud of? Yeah. So I, I feel like a lot of the successes I've had, I've been you know, in the right place at the right time. So you always feel lucky and sure. you know, so I don't take credit for or too much. I think a lot of it was just being the right person in the right time in the right place. Um, I feel uh, good about my dedication to patient care. I, you know, I've, I've always done my best for patients, not that I haven't made mistakes, uh, but I've done my best for patients. I feel very good about my trainees. I have so many trainees. Michigan's a huge trainee program sure. and I've been there for 35 years on the faculty. Uh, and so that's one of the joys of coming to DDW sure. is to see you know, all these trainees from all these years and to catch up with them. Um, that's one of the reasons I love DDW. Sure. So I would say those are the two big things. Well, I mean, I would love to pick your brain for the next few hours. In fact, we should go downstairs to the lobby bar and, and continue this, but I think, I think our time is probably done here. All right. Thanks very much, Joe. Thank you for inviting me to do this.